Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Brent Bushy with the Public School Resource Center and uh, really excited to have Todd Lofton join us. Todd's at the State Department of Education and is, what, what's your, I, I forgot to write down your formal title, Todd. Executive Director of Special Education. Okay, cool. That's what I thought it was. Um, so we know that as schools are, we've got what, one week until we move to distance learning. Um, we know that schools are you know, feverishly putting their plans together, how they're going to serve their students. Um, there's a few hot topics out there. You know, one of them is connectivity. Um, and how do we make sure that students uh, you know, are connected to the internet if schools are going to be using that? Um, and no matter what they do, I think they want, you know, what, what's the best way that, that schools can communicate with schools? There's a, there's a language barrier, ELL, um, uh, lots of other topics, but definitely one that I constantly see whenever we're, you know, the SD's been doing these chats and there's lots of questions around special education. How the heck am I supposed to serve um, students with special needs? And I will shut up here soon, but you know, this is a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart um, because I'm a former special educator and I'm now a consumer of the public school system because my daughter has Down syndrome. So, um, you know, so I, I come at this from, from a couple different vantage points and uh, I've been really impressed with, the, with you know, how Todd you've been um, fielding questions and comments and thought it'd be great just to get you on and have a, have a quick conversation. Todd, I think I lost your sound. Still here. Can you hear me? Oh, there you go. Okay, good. Sorry. Hey. The, the world is Zoom every once in a while. So, okay. So, Todd, um, so tell us what, you know, what have you guys done on the, on the special education front related to distance learning so far? Well, what we've done so far is we've created some, we've created a guidance document specific to special education that tries to hit on various topics about, you know, secondary transition, early childhood, uh, assistive technology, a lot of things that uh, wouldn't show up in the agency-wide guidance that we thought we should address. We're working on some related services guidance. We have some information about related services posted currently. And we are trying to look at it in the sense of, you know, outside of a global pandemic, what should distance learning look like for students with disabilities? Um, and then we also have been, you know, answering questions and trying to put out guidance specific to uh, uh, compliance requirements under the IDEA during a time where all students are receiving instruction through a distance learning model. And one thing important that we like to talk about, you know, is don't change a good IEP. Uh, we don't want everybody to suddenly amend their IEPs. Right now, we just know that distance learning is the general education environment. And so when we're looking at FAPE and talking about FAPE, we're looking at it in terms of measuring it against your district's current district distance learning model. And so a lot of this is gonna be based on how your district chooses to provide distance learning. Um, and there are a lot of issues with connectivity again, uh, and uh, ideas about non-technological distance learning. And really, um, you know, the key is to be as flexible as possible, to communicate with parents and, um, you know, kind of be on the same page and, and be reasonable, you know, in regard to what the parent can do at home and in regard to what your teachers can do. You know, we don't want teachers suddenly thrust into a position where they have little guidance and training or capability to suddenly do a virtual classroom. Even if your school is, maybe you need to have teachers develop packets for some things. Maybe you need to email parents directly, get on the phone with them and, and go through some of the things with them, especially for our students with more significant cognitive disabilities. We've been working on some other resources on that end. Uh, we're hoping to get some things from BLM sorted out. And also um, UCOs has a group that are behavior, um, they have a behavioral consultant contract with us. So they normally go in and coach parents and teachers on students with significant behavioral challenges. And they've created some videos for us that are short, about five minutes that parents can also watch. Uh, it's geared towards them. Okay. So that'll be a good resource for people. But again, you know, it's kind of, you know, being reasonable, making sure everyone's safe, including your staff. Um, and then 
you know, making reasonable, good faith efforts at providing quality instruction during this time. With the knowledge that, um, you know, I, I don't like to say compensatory education because districts aren't at fault here for anything. They're put in a situation that they don't they have little control over. So, you know, there'll be a time to review student progress during this time and determine what additional services and supports may be necessary in the future. Uh, I've seen a lot of districts go above and beyond already, you know, in terms of, you know, people who don't have virtual access or a computer, they've gotten it for a parent um, and provided it to them so that they could receive um, any kind of teletherapy services or things like that. Uh, we also have to remember though that a lot of people at home, even virtually, uh, people working from home don't necessarily have a laptop for every single person in their family. And so it's not as if your student could be on your computer all day while you're working from home. I'm sure that's the case for most of us. Um, and then, you know, one of the big things is remembering that compliance is ultimately a function of individualization. So whatever the case, just make sure you're looking at those IEPs, saying, you know, of the accommodations we have here, how can we apply them in a virtual or distance learning environment? What would that look like? And, you know, one easy example I use is a read aloud. You know, you can call a student and read something with them. You know, there's all sorts of things you can do like that. There's um, for students with more significant cognitive disabilities. Also, there's things you can do where if they have a, some kind of functional skills curriculum, you can give parents ideas about how they can use those same functional skills at home, which is the purpose of a functional skills curriculum anyway. Um, and I think a lot of those parents are already used to, you know, being their child's teacher 24-7 versus our students who have um, more, you know, mild or moderate disabilities. Yeah. Let me jump in there. Lots of questions there. I think lots of stuff. One, I just want to echo what you said about communication, right? Like, I know my wife and I were tense, not just about my daughter with Down syndrome, but excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, gotta love the allergy season. Um, but, uh, you know, both daughters and how, how are we gonna, you know, how are we gonna meet their needs, you know, while also working ourselves? Um, and man, it just helped when the, when the teachers reached out, right? Like they reached out with, uh, with emails and texts, um, and just, you know, just hearing their voice, right. And also hearing that, you know, both teachers admitted, you know, right up front, hey, we don't really know what we're going to do yet, right? The district's still developing the plan. Um, but being honest about that, and then, you know, they also both shared how much they're missing the kids. You know, like they, they went on spring break <laughs> expecting to see kids again. Um, and just hearing that human side, I think is, it, it sounds so basic, but um, from a parent perspective, I know that helped my wife and I quite a bit. Um, and then, you know, to be able to hear specifically from um, my daughter, you know, the teacher, the teacher, my daughter with special needs um, and, you know, hearing how, you know, she's, she's processing, she didn't have a lot of um, solutions set up yet, but they were working on it and, and just knew that, you know, they recognized the need to, to figure this out was, was, was really reassuring to us. So uh, you said a few things that I want to ask some questions about, I and mean, I've heard you answer them a few different places, but I've heard schools say, well, I don't know how I'm supposed to do this without updating the IEP because of their placement. The placement is named on the IEP. Can you speak about that? Yeah, so uh, placement's not necessarily a physical location. We, um, services are marked on your IEP for collaboration and co-teaching and monitoring, direct instruction. Um, those may look different in a distance learning environment. It's not as if, you know, direct instruction from a special ed teacher is required to be done, you know, in physical proximity to a student. Um, it can happen multiple ways. So, um, and if you've taught online before, I like to tell people, you know, when you put 60 minutes of direct instruction down, even when you're teaching, uh, teachers are normally not talking for 60 minutes to we children. Don't. <laughs> no, that's, we, we don't, that's not great teaching. And so, you know, that time is not just the teacher talking. It doesn't have to look like that. You can, you know, if you have an assignment, this assignment's going to take probably, you know, the child 20 minutes or so to do, um, things like that. So it's, you know, some upfront instruction, 
you know, and then our students are working in groups on stuff in the classroom anyway. So it's not, and I don't think people should be so particular about those actual seat time minutes, you know, uh, especially for students with disabilities, we're looking at, you know, what are some specific IP goals we could really focus on? Like, what are some ones that would really lend themselves to this kind of environment? And let's, let's talk to the parent about those and say, hey, this, these are the ones that we're going to really try to get a lot done with currently and go from there. So, uh, I, so I know a lot of people have issues about the placement and things like that, but again, the placement for all students now is, the di is distance learning. Just the same way we say that uh, students in a virtual charter school or virtual environment, the gen ed environment is the virtual environment. So when we think about a, you know, continuum of placements in a uh, least restrictive environment, we're thinking of it from that standpoint first. So how are all students receiving instruction? And based on that, how can I get my students with disabilities to that level of gen instruction, how it's happening in general? Cool. You mentioned the guidance document that you put out specifically for special education, as well as some videos that you've done. Those are all publicly available, the videos and everything? Or? Yes. Okay. If we can get right on our special ed services homepage. Okay. All right. So we'll, in our show notes here, um, we'll make sure that we put a link there so that folks can get to those, those documents and, and that guidance. So um, there's just so much information out there right now. It's, it's a little hard to digest for people. There is a lot of information and that's why we say, you know, the first thing you need to do is get an idea about what your district's doing and talk to your parents Yep. and help, help allay any fears that they have, you know, get an idea about, you know what they're capable of doing at home by themselves and what extra supports they may need um, yep. but that, that's really key to this whole thing yep and you know some schools have said i don't know how we're supposed to use technology or anything i mean and, and a few schools have even pointed out to me last friday when the uh, state superintendent got on with senator langford and first the superintendent's computer crashed. And then right when Senator Langford started speaking, he was sitting out on his porch and it started hailing. So he had to go inside, you know. And, you know, so schools have pointed that to me as an example of, well, see, this is why we can't do it if they can't even get that right. And my response has been, actually, the call got done, right? Like, I think we all realized, like, this is, this is the world we live in, right? Like, <laughs> I'm glad that my kids haven't walked in on this podcast, but they have walked in on others. <laughs> And um, I'm fortunate to not have a dog right now because <laughs> that would, you know, but, um, you know, that's just sort of the world that we live in. And I think, you know, so teachers are great on so many levels. And I think one of the strengths of teachers that may hold them back right now is they want to make sure that things are perfect, right? They want to make sure that things are 100% of the kids, 100% of the ways. And I think we've all got to recognize that the world has changed drastically. No one's good at this. We're very few people are good at it. Um, yeah. And, you know, getting things 100% right may not be possible right away, but that doesn't mean we don't lean in and work, work our butts off, right? Well, and, you know, I, I think of a special ed teachers are, they are the teachers that are literally trying to think outside the box all of the time anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so they've kind of got a leg up on gen ed teachers. And the other thing that, I like to share with directors is just, you know, give, give your teachers primers and guidance, but let them be, you know, brave and innovative in how they're actually providing instruction. Yeah. You know, without, you know, don't hold them back, you know? I, I, I couldn't agree with you more on that. Like, you know, give them the, you know, give teachers the, um, you know, I always say, I'll give you the boundaries and you know, whatever's inside the boundaries, you go ahead and get after it. Right. And, right. Um, you know, one of the things that we hear from schools a lot, and as a dad, I don't like, I don't like drill and kill. I don't like test prep kind of materials. We don't have to worry about that stuff, right? Like, this is our chance to get creative. I, I don't want to put a, you know, too rosy a picture. Like, we know that there are learning environments that some of our kids are stuck in that are not good. We know that there are some families that either can't or won't provide or won't help out students. And, you know, we should rightfully be worried about those, those, those kids. And, Unfortunately, there's not a ton we can do. Um, on the flip side, you know, this is an opportunity to try out new ideas. You shouldn't be constrained really by, by you know, there's no, no state testing to worry about. Um, I mean, obviously there's still state standards and whatnot, but like there is a, 
there's a treasure trove of, of content available out there, almost all of it for free right now. Um, and so I, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the creative things that the Oklahoma teachers are going to be, be trying out. Yeah, it's an unfortunate situation. I think in the end, we'll have a better idea about how to do distance learning for our kids. Yep. I think that districts already have built great relationships with families and all of this. And that's something that, you know, we can really lean into right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, there was uh, another question I've heard a lot, and you've answered it in a bunch of places, but you know, just talk about IEP meetings and how you do this when you, when you can't get together face to face. So IP meetings, you know, you've always been able to do things like phone conferences and virtual meetings. I think now um, a lot of people who haven't done that in the past, it, it seems really uh, intimidating to them. It doesn't have to be. We have a virtual IP meeting checklist on our webpage. Uh, there's options to sign documents within EdPlan electronically, um, which, which I'm hoping that something that comes out of this is that people really utilize everything in, in that system more. Yeah. Um, but the kind of the key is, you know, making sure that just like any IP meeting that, you know, no one's in the room, no one's going to come into the room with you. You know, it's at a time where all able to focus. Um, I'd suggest always for parents who haven't been in one before to, you know, give them a call beforehand and just say, here, here's how this is kind of going to kind of go. Make sure that they, are able to connect if you're doing it virtually, things like that. The IP team members are still required to be there. You know, there are exceptions to that. If um, someone's um, subject's not being discussed, things like that. And But in all of those cases, just like before, uh, we suggest that gen ed teachers, anybody submits information to everyone first. And we, we actually have within EdPlan a, a system where you can send documents to parents through EdPlan Connect. Uh, if they have an email address for the parent and things like that. So hmm. I'm a parent. I didn't know. So there's a system out there that schools can use for communicating all of that. Yes. They're always a little worried about using it for security issues. So you have to be very sure that you put in the correct email and contact information for a parent. Okay. But then the parent can essentially, uh, they'll get an email saying you have documents to view. Um, so that they would be able to view like your, the finalized IP, things like that. That's pretty cool. I like that. Yeah, it's a, I wish more people would use it. They are concerned about getting those email addresses wrong and sending it to the wrong person. Uh, sure. But there's all sorts of disclaimers and kind of security functions built into it. But, yeah. Uh, but, but then other than that, you know, just making sure parents have the information beforehand is always good. And that's, that's what we talk about for all IP meetings. Um, yeah. 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 Um, the um, that's a really good idea that I had never, I just hadn't, hadn't even crossed my mind that that, that that you have a system for that. So that's great to know. Um, you mentioned before we started recording um, that you're working with Medicare and you expect to have some additional guidance on that. Right. So we have a meeting with the Oklahoma Health Care Authority tomorrow, which is the 31st. If you're watching this after that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we're trying to get some in, some information from them on, about Medicaid billing and what that can look like. Um, we've been meeting with them for several years and uh, just making sure that districts are documenting and they're able to bill for the services that we're currently billing for in an appropriate way, all of that. Okay. Are there any other common questions that are coming in from schools right now that you wanted to get answers out on or cover the out ones? Um, yeah, uh, evaluations are a big question. What to do about initial evaluations? Yeah. And the guidance from the feds also is that, you know, these are extenuating circumstances, obviously. And there are some evaluations that just cannot be done uh, when you're not, not in person. If there's any kind of manipulations for that evaluation, like a, an ADOS or an IQ test. So there's going to be some, there, there will be some issues with that and people will be out of compliance. But um, like I tell districts all the time, if you're out of compliance for something, we'll just tell you to do better during the next global pandemic. You know, <laughs> there's not much you can do. What you can do if you're in the middle of it and can't complete it, it, you know, you might not be able to provide specially designed instruction to students that aren't 
technically eligible for special education, but you can use other interventions. Accommodations are free and can be used for everybody. Yep. You can utilize universal design for learning principles. You, you should have enough information already without some formal evaluations that could guide you in. Um, you know, you know that this student has particular needs and you can talk to the parent about that and say, uh, you know, we are planning to com complete this evaluation as soon as possible. But in the meantime, here's some things we're going to do that we think might help. Yeah, and I know probably part of the concern is legal liability, but I think a lot of like liability issues can be addressed if parents realize, one, we're in unprecedented times, right? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's just just is. Uh, and two, if they see that schools are trying to help out, I'm sure it's not a perfect solution. I'm still sure that there are unreasonable people out there um, that, 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 you know, may cause problems. But I, I've got to imagine the majority of people out there um, would recognize the situation and would appreciate the, the support. You know, if you take the approach of, well, you know, because we can't do the evaluation, we can't provide any accommodations, then probably likely going to get in trouble and you know, it's probably a good thing that you would. Um, but if you take the reasonable approach and provide you know, those accommodations as much as you can, you'd think that everyone would be reasonable. Yeah, I think parents will. And we've, uh, you know, we're on the same page with the director of special services in the Oklahoma Parents Center. We've been talking to the Oklahoma Disability Law Center. Just to kind of all push that message out, we're working on a joint statement modeled after the uh, joint statement between National Association of State Directors of Special Education, the Council of Parent Advocates and Attorneys, and the National Disability Rights Network. All just to kind of get the message out there, hey, let's all be reasonable, let's work together. People are gonna do their best during this time and make good faith efforts. And that's that's the expectation that people will try. Yep. And, and that really just involves making sure you communicate, not being, um, you know, like you're saying with evaluations, not saying, oh, well, we can't do anything. You know, there's something you can do. You know, you might have to think through it. It might be a little difficult. Yep. But I always say to people, too, um, it's also difficult to be a child with a disability uh, receiving an education without any support. So as adults without disabilities um, and educators, it's our job. You know, we're, we can do those things. And so that's, that's our job to make their lives easier. So. You know, you, you hit on a personal note for me when you when you brought up. You know, it's not it's not it's not easy for kids with disabilities. My um, my my oldest is the one with Down syndrome. My youngest is uh, typically developing. She's a few years behind. Um, they are usually the best of friends. They're siblings, right? So they have their disputes. Um, and um, my my daughter with Downs can be difficult, right? She can be stubborn. She can be a big pain in the butt sometimes. Um, I remember one day my younger daughter was upset because Maddie had been mean to her and I pulled her to the side and I said, Hey, I know it's not always easy being Maddie's sister. And she said, yeah. And then she paused and she said, do you know what dad? I don't think it's always easy being Maddie either. And it was a, you just reminded me of that comment. It kind of hit me, right? Like, like kids get it sometimes. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah and I, I just want to, I just want to echo that. I think a lot of times, especially in the special ed world, we worry about, you know, having that perfect solution or, you know, trying to be a hundred percent compliant. And I've seen a lot of comments on, on Facebook about that. We can't do this because we um, are you know, trying, you know, because, because we can't do everything perfect. And I, you know, I, I think we've got to get that mind shift. I've used the phrase, don't let great be the enemy of good. Right? Like, don't let the perfect solution or you know, the failure to have that perfect solution slow you down um, because that's what we need right now. We need those imperfect solutions that we're all working hard on and trying to get better at. So, right. We'll work the compliance out in the end as much as we can. Right? We'll try to be as compliant as possible. But yeah, in the end, it's really just about what do these kids as individuals need? How can we support them? And that's, that's what educators are being asked to look at right now. Great. Well, I, I know you're busy. I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, we'll put it in the show notes how folks can can you know reach out to the um, guidance documents that you've got there. I know ten thousand people are burning up your phones. So, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're all teleworking, but we're all also we're all on Teams right now. So <laughs> that's all online. We're answering emails and 
palm people as much as we can all of that so that's fantastic yeah yeah we've we have learned how to rely on like we use slack at the resource center and thank god we had that in place because it allows us to communicate back and forth just like microsoft teams so um mm -hmm. if there's anything else i wanted to just end by you know saying thank you once again you guys are are working I know night and day so I, I'm not sure you even know what a weekend is anymore hopefully one of these days you'll you'll figure out that, <laughs> that part out is there anything else you wanted to close with uh no just um just what I already said you know just uh people are gonna just make good faith efforts and serving your students and that's gonna be what we all need to focus on is just those actual kids cool all right well thanks Todd appreciate it thank you